Most political observers and pollsters say the outcome of the fall elections will hinge on the economy. That's what Robert Kuttner will answer today. Robert Kuttner is an award-winning national commentator on economic policy and this year's Wayne Morse Chair at the University of Oregon's Center for Law and Politics. If you're not familiar with the center, we have some information about it on the table in the back. Robert is a co-founder and co-editor of the American Prospect magazine, as well as a founder of the Economic Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. He's authored nine books on economic policy, including The Squandering of America, How the Failure of Our Politics Undermines Our Prosperity. He's a longtime columnist for Business Week, and his writing has appeared in a wide range of publications. And without further ado, please help me welcome Robert Kuttner. Thanks so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in uh, Oregon, and I've uh, particularly enjoyed uh, being the Wayne Morris Chair. Uh, when I was a very young legislative assistant uh, in Congress uh, many, many years ago, Wayne Morse was uh, in the Senate. He was someone who I admired. Uh, I subsequently worked for Senator William Proxmire uh, as his chief investigator, uh, a man very much in the spirit of Wayne Morse. Uh, and I uh, just have had a marvelous time uh, meeting with students, uh, co-teaching a course, uh, meeting with community leaders, lecturing. And it's just uh, been a marvelous uh, three weeks. I've got two weeks to go. So thank you for having me uh, at this forum. Uh, I want to talk about what's going on with the economy and then about how the economy uh, interacts with electoral politics. Usually, not surprisingly, a bad economy is bad uh, for incumbent presidents. We can uh, recall Jimmy Carter in uh, 1980 when uh, the Federal Reserve under Paul Volcker briefly put the interest rates up to 21.5 percent, uh, losing to Ronald Reagan. We can recall George H.W. Bush uh, in 1992 when there was a not particularly bad recession, but people were worried about it. And uh, the internal slogan of the Clinton campaign was, it's the economy, stupid. And uh, Bill Clinton relentlessly talked about the economy, another case of an incumbent losing uh, based on a bad economy. The, the one exception uh, was Franklin Roosevelt, where uh, the economy was still really terrible two years and four years after he was elected in 1932, but uh, the Democrats picked up seats both times, and uh, Roosevelt won uh, a historic landslide in 1936, uh, carrying all but two states, even though unemployment was still 18 percent because people really felt that <clears throat> he was on their side and people felt that help was on the way. Um, there's a political scientist at Yale, Ray Fair, who says that he can predict the uh, outcome of an election based on a model that cranks in uh, factors of how the economy is doing. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this time it's a mixed picture. Uh, the economy's improving. Uh, it's back down to 7.8 percent unemployment, for the first time lower than it was when um, Obama took office. Uh, Obama is trying to remind the voters that he inherited a mess, but I think most people feel that it's not improving enough. Uh, median incomes are back down to their level of 1990, and uh, young people in particular who are saddled with a trillion dollars of college debt. Uh, Young people voted by, uh, by a margin of 71 to 29 for Obama in 2008, uh, and now they're going out into the world into a terrible economy, saddled with debt, and um, they don't have a very favorable uh, experience of how the economy has improved in the last four years. So the economy is, at, at best, I think, a draw or a slight disadvantage for Obama as the president. But interestingly, the economy seems to be overshadowed by the relative performance of the two candidates. So you had this period when uh, 
Romney uh, did not have a very good convention. The Republicans did not have a very good convention. And then there were all these other stumbles. And uh, it looked like the race was locking at about a six-point lead for the Democrats. And then uh, Obama turned in a, a much worse than expected performance uh, in the first debate, uh, leaving the Republicans to regain the momentum. And so the election right now, a little more than three weeks out, um, seems to be about tied. Now, I want to come back to the election in a moment, but, but I want to spend most of uh, these 40 minutes talking about what's really going on with the economy. Why is the economy such a mess? And I think there are three factors that antedate the great collapse of 2008 that still have lingering effects, and then there are the effects of the collapse itself. Uh, the first problem that suggests the underlying weakness of the economy is what I would call the financialization of the economy. We, we've had several decades now when manufacturing has been hollowed out, uh, a lot of it has moved overseas, and we tried to compensate. Th th this wasn't a deliberate plan by a bunch of commissars in Washington. It was just the way things worked out. But into the vacuum, we had an ever larger, uh, ever more innovative financial industry. One statistic really captures this. Uh, in the first two decades after the war, about 12 percent of all of the corporate profits in America were uh, in finance, banks, uh, insurance, uh, um, investment banks, etc. In 2006, on the eve of the collapse, that figure was 41 percent. Now, at some point between 12 percent and 41 percent, uh, the money that the banking industry takes out of the rest of the economy ceases being a reasonable payment for a service and starts becoming a tax. And uh, in addition to uh, the money that finance takes out of the real economy, there are also the risks that the kind of, of financial complexity uh, imposed on the real economy, uh, very high degrees of leverage, um, products that uh, really amounted to a house of cards that nobody understood, uh, not even the people who were creating CDOs and CDOs squared and CDOs cubed and credit default swaps backed by no reserves. You all know the story. So I think the hollowing out of the real economy and the uh, toxic innovation of finance, one of the sources of the underlying weakness that came home to roost in the collapse of 2007, 2008. Uh, the, um, the second problem is um, a shift in the distribution of income, uh, leaving ordinary people with paychecks that uh, did not really keep play, pace with inflation. Uh, for the first 30 years after the war, wages uh, rose in lockstep with productivity. and. Um, for the 30 years after that, almost all of the gains went to the very top. Now, this is not uh, a rhetorical claim. The statistics are just unequivocal on this. And um, people can debate why this happened. There are some people who blame it on, on the fact that the, uh, the workforce uh, was not sufficiently well educated in, in an increasingly competitive world. There are other people who claim that uh, foreigners were simply willing to do the same jobs for a lot less money, leaving American workers uh, bid out of the market. Um, there are others who would argue that a whole generation of what the Harvard economist Richard Freeman calls equalizing institutions became a lot weaker. Public investments, uh, inexpensive higher education, uh, strong trade unions, uh, higher minimum wages, uh, higher unemployment compensation, regulation of lots of industries that stabilized labor markets as a kind of unintended side effect, as well as a more progressive tax code. But for whatever reasons, uh, the income distribution became a lot more unequal. And the third factor uh, that describes the underlying weakness of the pre-crash economy that also led to the crash was the reliance on debt. Now, here I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball because I think a lot of people who focus on debt focus on the national debt. Uh, I would make an argument, and I hope I'm persuasive here, that the more serious forms of debt are, are private debt. Uh, 
there's a political scientist who calls this privatized Keynesianism. Uh, it wasn't so much the government whose debt kept the economy propped up, but it was various forms of private borrowing. And after all, I mean, the budget was balanced and the debt was coming down as recently as 2001. The debt was forecast to uh, be paid off within two decades to the point where the Federal Reserve was concerned about how it was going to conduct monetary policy when there were no more treasury bonds to buy and sell. So what kinds of private debt? Well, one thing that happened during the past 20 years, actually more since about the early 1980s, is that as interest rates went down and mortgages became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, housing prices went up. And housing prices went up a lot faster than incomes. And so the middle class got into the habit of substituting uh, debt for income. If you have an asset that is inflating faster than the general rate of inflation, you can borrow against it. And the financial uh, industry was very accommodating in uh, rebranding second mortgages uh, as home equity loans and third mortgages as home equity lines of credit. Now, when I was a pup, uh, a second mortgage was something, you know, that's risky. You don't want to do that. But you rebrand it as a home equity loan. Hey, this is very convenient. And so um, you, you had a whole generation, the, the, the second post-war generation, that was rather hard-pressed econ uh, economically. And instead of doing what the first post-war generation did, namely um, paying off the house and having a little bit extra for your nest egg when you retire, uh, the, uh, the second post-war generation kept refinancing and taking out equity and uh, piling home equity loans on top of that and using debt as a way of sustaining consumption. Now, this is not to say that the first post-war generation was good guys and the second post-war generation was bad guys because real wages were going up. So it was easier to be virtuous uh, in the period between 1945 and 1979. It was harder uh, after 1979 when wages started falling behind productivity. Well, in any case, this worked until the housing bubble collapsed. It bit up the housing bubble, and then when the whole thing collapsed, you could no longer use uh, debt as a substitute uh, for income. So that's one kind of debt. Now, the sequel to this story is the mortgage debt overhang. You've got about $700 billion of uh, debt that exceeds the value of the collateral against it. And uh, the mortgage debt overhang is really acting as a kind of lead weight uh, on the recovery. Uh, the Obama administration has a couple of token programs that haven't really uh, done enough to solve this problem, uh, nor uh, do the Republicans have much to say on this. Uh, you, one of your senators, by the way, is an absolute champion on this, Jeff Merkley. I heard him give a speech on this the other night, and this is a, this is a strategy that could uh, conceivably get support from both parties. I'll have more to say about that uh, a little later. But in any case, so you've got the problem of consumer debt, uh, mortgage debt, a trillion dollars of college debt that we sort of backed into. Uh, we backed into it because we've underfunded <clears throat> our great public universities and we've said to the next generation for the first time, uh, you are going to start off with this uh, lead weight tied to your feet. Uh, but the other kind of debt that doesn't get talked about very often is the short-term debt that uh, financial institutions incurred in order to try to become more like hedge funds. And if you recall the history of the 2007-2008 of the collapse, uh, the first one to go was Bear Stearns in, in March uh, of 2008, and then Lehman Brothers. And the business model, unlike a commercial bank where you take in deposits, you make loans, you are very prudent in your underwriting, and you don't become mega rich, you make a nice living, and you pay very, very careful attention to the quality of the credit. Uh, not too many losses in commercial banking uh, pre-repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1979. But if you're in this other form of new wave investment banking, um, you don't take in deposits. Um, you borrow money in the overnight market, the so-called repurchase or repo market. 
and your ability to keep borrowing in the overnight market uh, is only as good as your reputation. And if your creditors start thinking that you've loaded up on a lot of bad subprime paper, they cut you off overnight. And even though um, Bayer was sitting on 20 or 30 billion dollars, uh, the debt equity ratio, if you will, uh, was 30 to 1, 50 to 1, and on top of that, there were all of these special purpose vehicles, off balance sheet accounting, that wasn't even uh, included. And so you can lose everything overnight when you have that degree of leverage. Now, leverage is a fancy word for debt. So the economy pre crash had all of these forms of debt that were keeping it afloat, privatized Keynesianism, if you will. And uh, the public debt was actually in relatively good shape until the collapse uh, itself. So all of these were the, were the underlying uh, weaknesses in the economy that <clears throat> the average person experienced as a <clears throat> deterioration of living standards. Um, the other factor I think that's very relevant, and uh, there's a, a wonderful book on this by two uh, young political scientists who actually uh, grew up in Eugene, uh, Jacob Hacker, who now teaches at Yale, and Paul Pearson, who teaches at the University of California at Berkeley, called The Great Risk Shift, um, talking about the fact that risks, which used to be borne by large corporations or by the government, have been shifted onto individuals. The shift from uh, defined benefit pensions to IRAs and KEOs and 401ks, uh, the risk of losing your job, uh, the risk of a whole industry uh, disappearing, uh, and the instability of the last 20 or 30 years economically has uh, gone hand in hand with a period of government and large institutions uh, weakening any kind of collective responsibility for people's security. So here comes an election, uh, and what are the parties offering, and who does the average voter hold responsible? Well, in 2008, uh, it would have been difficult not for the Democrat to win. Uh, you'd had uh, 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 the most serious collapse since the Great Depression happened on September 15th of an election year. And you had a Republican candidate not handle it terribly well. And so this was sufficient even for uh, a young, untested African-American uh, Democrat to win election by not a huge margin. And so then the question is, here we are four years later, and who is to be held responsible for the fact that the recovery is sort of sputtering along on two or three cylinders and is not what anybody hopes it would be, not even uh, President Obama. Now, um, along with this, you really have a shift in the nature and the ideology and the tactics of the Republican Party. Uh, this is a state uh, really famous for uh, moderate Republicans. Um, Tom McCall, Mark Hatfield, uh, Bob Packwood, uh, and of course, um, on, the, on the Democratic side, you've got uh, Ron Wyden, who uh, prides himself on crossing the aisle. You've got Merkley, who's more of a lefty, but who's trying to work with Republicans on a, on a rescue of the, of the mortgage situation. Uh, Ted Kulongoski, who started out as a labor lawyer and offended uh, a lot of his labor friends by working with uh, the business community and the Republicans to try to reform PERS. And then you have the great independent himself, Wayne Morse, who managed to uh, serve under the aegis of both parties. Uh, but what's, what's going on in the Republican Party these days is, is very, very un-Aragonian. Um, the strategy has been to, uh, to block, and that works not only politically, but it works ideologically if you think that the problem is government. You, you make it very difficult for government to do its job, and then uh, both parties reap the blame symmetrically. Uh, there's a marvelous book on this subject called It's Even Worse Than It Looks by the team of Thomas Mann and Norman Ornstein, one of whom is a Democrat based at Brookings, uh, the other whom is a Republican uh, 
uh, based at the American Enterprise Institute. But in, in their latest book, it's even worse than it looks, they write that today's legislative deadlock is caused by, quote, asymmetric polarization. Uh, the Republicans uh, will not compromise, and while the Democrats are more traditional and are willing to uh, compromise on some things, but the gridlock plays to the ideological advantage of the Republicans because it shows how ineffective government is. And this is the Grover Norquist uh, strategy of uh, getting government uh, so small that you can drown it in a bathtub. And there's a, there's a counterpart of this uh, at the state level that goes back to Proposition 13 and um, uh, its spawn uh, in other states, uh, where you use a combination of supermajorities and caps to really hamstring local government. And the politics of this are very interesting. If, I mean, uh, my first book was on, on Proposition 13. It came out in 1979. It was called Revolt of the Haves. And um, w what happened there was that um, the 70s were very inflationary. Um, instead of reforming the tax code, the government in Sacramento, headed by a young governor by the name of Jerry Brown, um, used the rising ha housing prices as a way of collecting a windfall. Because the more property tax revenues went up, the less state aid was required, and the more Governor Brown, who was thinking of uh, running for president as a fiscally conservative liberal, could have bragging rights about the huge state surplus that was building up in the state treasury in Sacramento. So instead of figuring out a way of returning this money to the cities and the towns and the counties and the special districts, uh, Brown sat on this surplus and the tax revolt festered until uh, it became a kind of a conservative populist uh, cause. And I remember Howard Jarvis, who was this cantankerous guy in his mid-70s, debating these nice people from the League of Women Voters. And they would say, uh, you know, if this passes, um, the libraries are going to have to close. And Jarvis would snarl back, well, the schools aren't teaching the kids to read anyway. And so if you're, if you're losing your home because your property tax is trebled, because the politicians aren't really dealing with this, closing a library is no big deal. And I think that kind of uh, anti-tax populism um, took on a life of its own. Uh, you have it here in Oregon as well. Hamstringing government and creating a psychology where uh, government isn't delivering the goods. Uh, I'm frustrated with the gridlock of politics, so I might as well vote myself a tax cut because I can't vote myself a wage increase. And the maldistribution of income, where ordinary people are really suffering, combines with this anti-tax, anti-government um, psychology, and, and government gets even more hamstrung. So um, I think you all know the basic uh, liberal and conservative stories about what to do. Uh, conservatives would say uh, government's the problem. If government is being shrunken, that's good. That means more money in the pockets of citizens, government overregulates business, we need to get government out of the way and let the economy rip. Uh, liberals would say that uh, we all love private markets, but there are some things that private markets don't do well, and so we need a certain level of taxation to invest in education and research and um, pollution control and the things where you can't trust markets. But what's interesting to me is that the most powerful force right now in the political debate is really neither uh, liberals uh, nor conservatives, but it's a kind of center-right group with enormous influence who have focused on the national debt as if the national debt were the biggest single problem standing between us uh, and a recovery. Uh, the Peter G. Peterson Foundation has spent just under half a billion dollars to disseminate this view. There's about 10 other private commissions promoting the view that if you want to get a recovery going, you need to fix the debt. That's the name of the latest uh, campaign on this subject. Uh, President Obama was so influenced by this current of opinion that long before the economy was really in a recovery, he appointed a bipartisan commission under uh, Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson to uh, deal with the deficit. And um, 
the problem is that if you, if you make the deficit rather than the recovery the issue and you cut the deficit prematurely, it only adds to the contraction uh, of a weak economy. Belt tightening uh, doesn't lead to a recovery. Now, the story is that um, business people, and I'd be very interested how many of you reflect this description because there are business people in this room. Business people are hesitating to invest because they're not confident about what the debt to GDP ratio is going to be in 2023. And um, for, why is this? Well, it's because they're worried about inflation. Now, at this moment, the government can sell 10-year bonds uh, at under 2%, and it can sell 30-year bonds at under 3%. And if people were anxious about inflation, they would not dream of lending the government money for 10 years at under 2% uh, or uh, thir 30 years under, under 3%. So Paul Krugman calls this the confidence fairy, that if we just deal with the deficit, the confidence fairy will come and uh, will restore confidence to American business, and American business will go out and expand. And I think normal economics would say, no, the reason that business is not expanding is they don't see customers. Uh, I mean, we coexisted with a lot more regulation, a lot higher tax rates, and bigger deficits in the 50s and 60s because ordinary people had money in their pockets, and uh, so business uh, could expand. So now, how does this all play out uh, in the election? Uh, I mean, I was kind of hoping that the election would be a nice clear debate between the liberal view and the conservative view, especially given the fact that American politics is so polarized. So you would imagine that you would have a nice, clear argument with Obama playing the liberal and uh, uh, Romney playing the conservative. Unfortunately, uh, that's not the debate we're getting. The debate is really quite muddled. So let's start with Romney. Romney, I mean, I'm from Massachusetts. Uh, Romney began as a moderate, an old-fashioned moderate uh, Republican, but of course he needed to win the trust of the conservative base that dominates today's Republican Party, so he, he needed to make himself over as a conservative, and he did pretty well at that. But then he needed to compete in the, uh, in the general election, so he needed to make himself over a, as a moderate again, except that he's not quite abandoned the conservative uh, program either. So we have Romney saying that we can give everybody a tax cut without adding to the deficit or cutting taxes on the very wealthy or cutting back valued government services. Now, nonpartisan economists who've looked at the numbers say, no, you, you just cannot square that circle. The total tax cut adds up to $5 trillion, and there just are not enough uh, preferences, loopholes, deductions, exemptions in the tax code to get back that $5 trillion unless you want to do things like go after the charitable deduction or go after the home mortgage deduction, both of which are third rails uh, for politics. However, if you watch the two debates, you realize that this stuff is a little too complicated for civilians. And uh, if you start trying to challenge those numbers, you, you sound like a geek. You sound like a terminal policy wonk. And so um, if Obama or even Biden starts going after the arithmetic and um, Romney comes across as likable and a strong leader, uh, that trumps the arithmetic. Or if, uh, if Ryan comes across as a, as a fine young man and uh, Biden comes across as a little bit patronizing, uh, the, the one trumps uh, the substantive uh, rebuttal. Or take another issue, or actually a non-issue, uh, Social Security. Now, um, here are some facts on Social Security. According to the 2012 trustees report, using very conservative economic assumptions, uh, Social Security is out of balance over a 75-year period by about 1% of GDP. And if wages, which are the basis of payroll taxes, which are the basis of the Social Security trust funds, kept pace with, so, with productivity growth, as they did during the first 30 years after the war, Social Security, excuse me, would be in surplus forever. But of course, wages are not keeping pace with productivity. 
Uh, be between 1997 um, and 2000, Social Security's year of reckoning, when it could not pay all of its claims, receded by eight years. In three years, Social Security gains eight years of health, and the reason is that we had full employment and we had rising wages. But that doesn't get talked about. Rather, um, both parties seem to agree that uh, we need to, to prune back uh, Social Security. So let me, uh, let me quote from the transcript of the President's first uh, debate with Governor Romney. Uh, Jim Lehrer, Mr. President, do you see a major difference between the two of you on Social Security? Now this question, to use the technical political science term, is called a high-hanging curveball. You know, you're just supposed to wham the thing out of the park. So what did President Obama, because this is the Democrat's signature issue, right? It's been the signature issue since Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Social Security is phenomenally popular. Republicans off and on keep trying to privatize it, or they blame Social Security for the effect of tax cuts that they sponsored. So what did our president say? Obama. You know, I suspect that on Social Security, we've got a somewhat similar position. So at that moment, I felt like John Stewart. Right? What? What are you doing? That's Governor Romney's line. That's not your line. And he went on to say, the Social Security is structurally sound, but it's going to have to be tweaked by the way it was, the way it was by Ronald Reagan and Democratic Speaker Tip O'Neill. So that was 1983. And what was the tweak? They raised payroll taxes, they cut benefits, and they increased the retirement age by two years. A tweak. And if you go to the websites, of Romney and Obama, the language on what needs to be done about Social Security uh, is almost identical. So this is a very high-minded Barack Obama uh, taking Social Security uh, off the table as a partisan issue. And something very similar happened last night uh, in, the, in the vice presidential debate, right? Martha Raddatz says, why not raise um, the Medicare eligibility age by two years? Another whammo, high-hanging curveball. And what did the vice president say? Uh, did he say, that's the difference between uh, Congressman Ryan and me. They're going to raise the retirement, the, the, the eligibility age. We're not. Oh, no. He said, well, I was there in 1983, last time we raised the retirement age. Said, what are you doing? <laughs> so I think uh, Governor Romney has done a much better job at blurring the differences between himself and President Obama than President Obama has done uh, in a fashion that allows regular people to feel that uh, the Republican ticket uh, understands them. And this is not just about who's the, the better debater. I think to some extent Obama's positions are somewhat self-canceling uh, in the sense that on the one hand he's for recovery and jobs and public investment, but on the other hand he's for deficit reduction he does a little bit of saber rattling on Wall Street, but uh, he, he appoints um, Tim Geithner, uh, who is quite averse to doing anything to change the, the business model that, that crashed the economy. And um, even though you could say, I think, without being accused of being overly partisan, that uh, Romney's positions are also internally somewhat inconsistent, um, he has done a better job at reconciling positions that uh, are not really rec uh, reconcilable. So I think uh, the country is being denied the debate that it really needs on, uh, on where we ought to go to fix the economy. And I think despite the ferocious partisanship, uh, whoever is elected, there is a risk that we will be too deflationary too fast. Uh, Obama has promised uh, $4 trillion of uh, deficit cuts. Uh, over uh, uh, 10 years. The Republicans have promised $5.4 trillion. The Republicans would do it more with program cuts and some tax cuts. Uh, the Democrats would do it more with, uh, with some tax increases, and they'd try to preserve some programs. Uh, I think either way, the current business model of the big uh, banking conglomerates is, is likely to remain. I think either way, the next generation is likely to begin economic life uh, saddled with uh, horrific debts.
I think either way, uh, we will continue to kick the can down the road in terms of our relationship with China. We have both sides posturing tough. Uh, we have occasional uh, gestures like uh, yesterday's um, tariff that was imposed on, uh, on Chinese uh, solar panels that are being produced below cost and then dumped in the United States. But because the United States has backed into this relationship with China where um, our companies find it very convenient to uh, move production offshore, uh, our financial institutions find it very convenient to do business with the Chinese, and the Chinese are funding uh, 40 or 50 percent of our, of our foreign debt, uh, and we've got all of these geopolitical concerns. I don't think uh, either, uh, despite the saber, saber rattling, is, is close to reassessing in any fundamental way our relationship with China. So um, I realize some of these comments are a little bit uh, outside the box, but I, I want to leave you with, with one thought, uh, and I want to – actually, I want to leave you with two thoughts. Um, because you are exactly the sort of people that the deflate our way to recovery crusade uh, wants to reach. You're opinion leaders, you're business professional, governmental uh, leaders of this community, and you are the objects of the cut the debt campaign. It's particularly important that you really think hard about this. Um, I, I, I want to leave you with um, history's greatest unintended recovery program, namely World War II. So in 1939, the unemployment rate was 14 percent. Uh, the New Deal had been going into deficit at the rate of about 5 or 6 percent a year. It was enough to restore uh, positive G GDP growth, but it was not enough to put the economy back to its productive potential, and unemployment was still horrific. Uh, along comes the war. Um, unemployment melts to 2 percent. In the first six months of 1942, the government enters $100 billion of war production uh, orders. Industry is recapitalized. Workers are retrained. We invest massively in science uh, and technology. And in order to pay for this, we had very high surtaxes on the well-to-do, and we also borrowed an astronomical amount of money. The average uh, deficit during the four years of World War II was 26 percent. And so by the end of the war, uh, we had a debt ratio of 124 percent. Now, at the end of the war, there was no Bowles Simpson Commission targeting the debt ratio 10 years hence in 1955. Rather, economists and politicians of that era were worried about what we were going to do with 12 million returning GIs uh, who didn't have jobs so that we did not sink back into the Great Depression. And instead of worrying about how we're going to tighten our belts, we doubled down. We uh, passed the GI Bill. We passed the Marshall Plan. We invested in highways. We invested in universities and schools and junior colleges, later community colleges. And uh, the wartime boom rendezvoused with the post-war boom. Uh, somehow we need our way, we need to find our way uh, to that kind of policy, or we face uh, a decade, if not a generation, of an economy that is performing uh, below par. And one last, last thought. Um, Professor Galbraith used to say, you always have to say in conclusion to give the audience hope. Um, <laughs> we hear a lot about generational justice, generational warfare. Uh, geezers are supposedly uh, uh, living too high at the expense uh, of young people. Um, the fact is that 70 percent of elderly people depend on Social Security for at least half of their income. The fact is that the same low interest rates that uh, Chairman Bernanke has given the economy to try and levitate what would otherwise be a depression translate into almost no interest on savings accounts for older people. The fact is that um, traditional pension plans that pay a guaranteed benefit until you die used to cover 62 percent of Americans. They now cover 7 percent of Americans. And the average 401k plan uh, held by somebody on the eve of retirement uh, has $42,000 in it. If you annuitize that and add it to the average Social Security check, uh, 
you're left with an annual income of $16,200. So young people and old people uh, are not at war with each other in terms of generational justice. They are suffering in common unless you happen to be at, at the very pinnacle uh, of the income distribution. Uh, I really wish that these issues were more in the presidential debate. I think they're not. I think the economy as a topic is likely to be something of a wash, and the debate is going to turn on who is the more effective debater, and it's anybody's guess, least of all mine, uh, who might win. So thanks very much for having me. Thank you very much. And now if you have written question on an index card, <clears throat> excuse me, please hold it up high so the City Club staff can collect it from you now. Thank you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from today, today's Friday Forum host, Leslie Moorhead. Leslie is the club's, on the club's Board of Governor. She served as the club's secretary from 2010 to 2012 and was named Member of the Year in 2010. Leslie? Thank you, Pat. Um, Mr. Kuttner, I'm fascinated by all of this, and I have about a dozen questions swirling in my head, so I'll try to put some of them together. I want to ask you about the next three and a half weeks and ask you to put it in very specifics as much as you can, um, but also in the context of is this year different from previous presidential election years from two aspects, one the economic point of view and the other is a, sort of a personal political point of view. First of all, on the economics, we know, we, if we're paying attention, we should kind of know where we are in terms of economic indicators. But we're going to probably be seeing more numbers out in the next three and a half weeks. Will anything make a difference or is it too late if we get any good news or bad news on things like housing or consumer confidence or manufacturing, um, unemployment even? So that's my first question. Is it, will anything else make a difference? Um, be a game changer, in other words. And the second thing is about the personal popularity of the candidates and their image. Does that sometimes just trump the numbers? And well, how, how will that have an effect on this election, too? Yeah, good questions. Well, I think um, the unemployment numbers were slightly better than expected. Um, we're going to get one more month. The, the, the October numbers, I believe, will be out just before the election. I don't expect uh, any great change. I mean, the, the economy has been generating a little over 100,000 jobs a month, not nearly what it needs. I think it'll probably do that again. Um, because of the very low interest rates, you've had a, a, a boom in mortgage refinancing, and housing prices are finally starting to levitate. Uh, in most of the major metropolitan areas, they hit bottom uh, in early 2012, and they're going up a little bit. That's good for consumer confidence. It's good for the real estate market. It's good for all of the industries that feed on the real estate market, like construction and uh, home, uh, home building. Uh, furnishings. Um, so if, if Europe doesn't fall apart between now and then, which is a whole other question, but I, but I think it probably won't, uh, the news is probably going to be either neutral to slightly good. And yeah, I absolutely think that because the economy is so muddled and not being clearly articulated in the debate and such a wash in effect, I mean, you can, you can look at the glasses half full or half empty. Uh, I think it is going to turn more on uh, debating skill and spin and who persuades the voters that uh, he's the more likable uh, candidate, unfortunately. We will now take questions from the floor. As always, we invite members to the microphone to ask their question. Asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a privilege of City Club membership. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash this question mark, it means please wrap up your question. Also, I'll try to read at least one of the questions on the index cards from the members here today. Wynn Wakala, City Club member. You were talking about how people, uh, the first 30 years, the economy was going up and people weren't so much personally in debt. I look at our tax code and currently you can deduct a mortgage interest on a mortgage up to a million dollars, which is nowhere what normal people can afford. And that's money that could have been going into schools and whatnot. 
how do we get back for people the desire to not be so greedy? Whoa. Um, <laughs> you know, the first part of the question and the second part of the question are really two interesting different assumptions. Um, I'm not sure most people are, are that greedy. I think most people are struggling. Uh, I do think, and tax reformers have argued this for a long time, that if you turn the mortgage interest deduction into a credit so that the benefit, uh, as, as uh, President Obama told Joe the plumber, is better spread around, uh, instead of subsidizing the house in keeping with how lavish the house is, you, you, you tilt that the other way so that people uh, in more modest homes uh, people trying to become homeowners get more of the of the tax benefit through a credit rather than a deduction, and the credit's capped. It's a fixed amount. That would be a good policy change. Also, by the way, um, in the world of corporate finance, uh, debt is tax deductible and equity is not. And if that were not the case, you would not have the kind of extreme leverage that has been at the center of so much of the uh, financial uh, strategy that got us into so much trouble. Uh, Greg Schmidt, um, uh, City Club member. My uh, son um, and his new wife were married this past weekend, and they're starting their their life together with uh, nearly 180 thousand of student student debt. My uh, my daughter-in-law from law school, my son from. Um, two years of grad school. And my question to you, sir, is um, um, with, with education being such a strong component of our economic health, um, what, what initiatives are you know, taking place right now just to deal with this whole issue of student debt? And um, if no initiatives, maybe your thoughts on um, you know, what might be done to address that issue. Right. Um, the, the Obama administration um, did pass a law to give students an option to have uh, some of their debt related to their, to their income, so that you're paying it as a percentage of your income rather than a fixed amount. I would go even further in that direction, and I also think, frankly, um, if you want an economic stimulus program, I, I can't think of a better stimulus program than writing off a lot of that debt. Uh, this country has never done anything remotely like this to the next generation. Look at what we did for the next generation at the end of World War II. Young men, mostly and women, who'd fought in World War II. We said, we're going to give you a free college education. And now we're saying, uh, we're going to give you a college education, but we're going to load you up with debt, to the point where the home ownership rate among young adults is back to its level of 1900, because you go in, you apply for a mortgage, and they say, look, uh, uh, you got $180,000 worth of student debt, that's the cost of a house. And you don't get to uh, encumber yourself with debts for two houses. It's, it is unconscionable. And uh, it would be a terrific stimulus to just uh, write a lot of that off. Uh, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, when I studied economics, I remember the professor talking about it's guns or butter. And uh, my question is, as an economist, do you think that if we reduced our military expenditures, that we could make a significant improvement in the economy by deploying that money into the economy? Yes. Uh, I think we could certainly have an adequate defense with, with less money spent on the military, and uh, people can argue about how much that should be cut. Uh, I, I don't think it solves the problem by itself, but I think we could, we could certainly uh, reprogram a lot of that money to domestic needs. And most studies have shown that of, of all of the forms of government spending, dollar for dollar, uh, military spending is the least stimulative because a lot of it gets spent overseas, a lot of it stays within a rather rarefied uh, industrial sector. So yes, I, I mean, I think one has to divide the economic question from the national security and, and foreign policy question, but uh, I, I do, not being a, pol a foreign policy expert, I do agree with you that we could cut the military and that would be good for the economy. <laughs>
Uh, Joyce DeMonin, City Club member. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit on your comments about retirement security. I happen to know that AARP recently released a study that said 60% of boomers are insecure about retirement. What kinds of policy options can we have post-election that might help boomers prepare for retirement? Because as you noted, uh, so many of us are not ready. Well, I don't think we should cut Social Security, and I don't think we should raise the eligibility age for Medicare. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we, we used to have a retirement system that was based on the assumption that you stayed with an employer for most of your working life and that that employer had a pension system. And that has just been blown up. It's, it's been blown up partly by the changes in the structure of the economy, partly by the fact that corporations uh, no longer have traditional defined uh, benefit plans except for corporations that have long had them. And so I think what you need is a, a, is a universal portable pension system that is funded. Uh, and I would do it as a second tier of Social Security. Mm -hmm. Other people would do it uh, in the private sector. But uh, unless we do that, people are just not uh, amassing enough retirement savings through IRAs and KEOs and 401ks. And the other important thing is it has to be a real pension. Uh, a 401k is tax deferred savings. It's not a real pension. Uh, the, the difference is a pension pays you a fixed sum until you die. Uh, a 401k is simply a pot of money and when it runs out, it runs out and you can turn it into an annuity. But given the typical amount of money that people have in a 401k, the, the amount that it translates to as a monthly check is pitifully uh, inadequate. Hi, Carolyn Miner, City Club member. You mentioned before that there's a difference now in between the percentage of our economy that's devoted to finance uh, immediately post World War II and the current. And I was wondering how you would remedy that situation, and both in the ideal in, in the ideal case, and also as the case that might actually get passed through Congress. Well, I would, I would start by going back to something like the Glass-Steagall Act of 1933, which was repealed in 1999. I mean, Glass-Steagall said, if you want <clears throat> to be a commercial bank or a savings institution with uh, a deposit insurance, you are very tightly regulated, and there are all kinds of things you can't do. You can't make bets with uh, taxpayer-insured money. And if you want to be more speculative, God bless you, good luck, it's a free country, but use your own money. And if you go bust, that's your problem. The government doesn't bail you out. That, that was a very free market system in many respects, and it worked very well. There, there really were no uh, major financial collapses uh, between uh, 1933 and about 1980. That was the longest period that we went in this country without a financial panic, and it was a period of record growth. So we were doing something well. I'd start by going back to that. And the other thing I would do is I would radically simplify the whole uh, model of how the financial industry makes its money. The, the model that says you take in deposits, you make loans, <clears throat> and you are responsible for assessing the quality of the, of the uh, creditor uh, because you're sitting on the paper rather than uh, originating it and then turning it all into bonds and, you know, passing the risk. That was a pretty good model, too. Let me read a, let me read a question from the audience. I read that the U.S. infrastructure has fallen from fifth in the world to 24th in the world, I presume, in terms of its uh, uh, quality and, and current condition. Would the economy benefit from rebuilding our infrastructure? Well, I use World War II as an example of public investment, in this case, in prosecuting a war as, as the greatest stimulus we've ever known. I, I think, assuming we don't want another war, uh, there is a whole deferred uh, agenda of uh, investments that we need in basic infrastructure and in green infrastructure. The American Society of Civil Engineers says that the uh, total amount of deferred maintenance in basic things like bridges, roads, water and sewer systems is, is $2.4 trillion. That's a lot of infrastructure. It provides jobs. It stays in this country. It stimulates the economy. Most of it goes right back into the private sector, by the way. The companies that the government contracts with to, to do all this rebuilding, they're private companies. So I would start with something like that and then I would do a lot of a green investment uh, as well. 
Steve Katz, City Club. I'm a big fan of Robert Reich, and one of his solutions to this situation that we're in now is to raise the income tax level on, percentage rather, on uh, the upper levels of our economy. What do you think of that, and do you think that is practical? Well, I think you could certainly go back to the tax code of the Clinton era, which was a, a, a boom. Uh, the, the fact that tax levels on well-to-do people were moderately higher certainly did not interfere with uh, the boom of that era. Uh, I think you do it, you do it partly with uh, more taxation and partly with, uh, with temporary higher borrowing. And then when the government, uh, when the economy rather, has resumed growth, then you get the, the debt ratio down. You don't get the debt ratio down until you're back on a recovery path. I'm sorry to say that we've run out of time for further questions, and we'll have to close for today. Please join us next week for the City Council debate between Amanda Fritz and Mary Nolan. It'll be moderated by City Club member Len Bergstein. And as we close for today, please join me in offering a sincere thanks to today's speaker, Robert Ketter. We are adjourned.